thank you very much for coming and uh, also thank you very much for the for the nice invitation here to come to to Monash to this beautiful institute and actually this this campus um, yeah so uh, I want to talk a bit about describing winds and mass loss and really this is a talk for you so please feel free to interrupt me at any time if we don't get through half of the slide that's not a problem uh, we can just talk about it later today I'll also be here tomorrow um, yeah so to give you a brief uh, context about whoop, mm -hmm. uh, about myself uh, personal academic background I did my diploma at the University of Potsdam in, uh, in Germany where I also did my uh, my PhD a few years later uh, with uh, Professor Wolf Rainer Hamann, who is now retired, but as a lot of retired scientists is still uh, actively actually doing science, but is rid of all the administrative duties that you are as a professor. Um, then I, I did a short uh, postdoc there um, before actually moving to AMA Observatory as a postdoctoral researcher, and uh, a bit later then uh, I got this uh, independent fellowship there, which allowed me to do a bit more independent science. Um, with these guys here uh, that uh, some of you might know <laughs> and uh, then finally since August uh, 2021 I'm an Emmy Noether research group leader at the Zentrum für Astronomy in Heidelberg uh, which is kind of a virtual institute uh, and the actual building where I physically I'm located in is the ARI, the Astrophysical uh, Rechen Institute it's called, so Computing Institute. Um, this Emmy Noether uh, program is kind of a junior professorship uh, status, uh, unfortunately not coming with tenure, but uh, with a 3 plus 3 funding uh, scheme by the DFG for me and a small group. So here you see the uh, initial group where we are growing at the moment. I will get back to this uh, uh, at the very end. Uh, so at the, uh, on the leftmost you see uh, Ruhl, who is one of my PhD students, Matthäus on the right is the other. And uh, some of you might already know Vasha Ramachandran from some earlier conferences or virtual talks, who is a postdoc in my group. All right, uh, let's get back to the actual science. I probably don't need this introduction slide too much as I want to talk about massive stars, so I can gloss over this very quickly. But in this case, I really speak about stars with eight uh, to... Uh, the, the laser is probably... Hmm. Okay, the battery is running low. It seems like the, the laser is not working, but for the people on Zoom. Uh, not necessary anyhow, so uh, I'm really talking about this uh, scale of 8 to 10 solar mass stars where we can go all the way until core collapse. Uh, so I'm, I'm skipping most of this probably relatively uninteresting stuff for you, but of course what we actually want to find out how these early type stars, these OB stars, actually can make it all the way to become something like a Wolfrayi star and then of course how to get these things into uh, becoming gravitational wave sources and whether for example something like a Wolfrayi star is actually a stage that is important for gravitational wave sources or not. Um, now, most massive stars actually spend a lot of their life as hot stars, so uh, while cool star phases are also interesting, and I will cover this briefly, actually a lot of time, especially at lower metallicity, is spent in the hot star stage, and we see this here from uh, a lot of empirical studies, so uh, the tracks are just there for, uh, for reference, but all of these, these dots that you see there are stars that have been more or less detailed, uh, um, that have undergone a more or less detailed analysis, uh, and we see that, that we have significant populations of OB stars here, then we have this Wolfrayi population. We even have a few Wolfrayi stars in the SMC, and it's actually a big question where they are coming from, because we don't really see much stars here, right? And this is one of the mysteries that we have in our field, that we, we are missing the, the precursors of the Wolfrayi stars. So um, if, you, if you want a simple answer to that, you can just blame it on individual star formation history of the SMC, and they say, ah, these stars are all gone, and we just see the Wolfrayi stars right now. Um, but it's probably a bit more complicated than that. And uh, so there are theories about chemically homogeneous evolution that your stars just move here. But on the other hand, that also seems to be at odds with some of the, of the features that we see. So it's, it's still one of these things that we, uh, um, that we wonder a lot about. Actually, we are having this uh, Ulysses program now within the community where the uh, director of the STSCI um, dedicated 1,000 orbits with 500 of them dedicated to the massive stars. Um, to, to get kind of an atlas of uh, uh, hot star spectra, so OBs and a few Wolfrayes in the LMC and SMC. And while that's by far not covering the whole population, it's with the uh, coming end of Hubble at least one legacy data set that we'll work a lot on to, to get some more insights on how uh, uh, massive stars at low metallicities work. And unfortunately, we have to do LMC and SMC because the really, really low metallicity targets that we would really like to get to, we would need a next generation UV telescope to really get further down. We have a few targets in dwarf galaxies and I'm involved in analyzing some of them, but it's, it's, it's really, really hard. So um, why UV? Well, these stars are hot, so the flux maximum is in the UV and the UV is the source uh, for line-driven winds and outflows. It's also 
very crucial if you really want to get the precise temperatures of these stars because if you just look at the typical optical photometry your hot star will always be blue and you cannot really get bluer than blue in these filters so it's a problem of determining, uh, uh, determining them and for example if you look at the Gaia catalog which has this beautiful estimate of all the stellar parameters it will be horribly wrong for all hot stars so a star that's 50,000 Kelvin uh, hot will be picked as a 6,000 Kelvin star or something. So it's, it's completely unreliable in this regime because it was never tailored to do that and simply because the photometry from that range is not sufficient to, to do that. All right, um, which brings me to my main field, stellar winds uh, in, in the regime for massive stars. Massive stars have significant, have significant winds and we can really see here all kinds of, of different regimes where uh, things are going on in the OB star regime, uh, in the red supergiants, uppermost then the, the LBV which is still kind of, of a mystery box and we, we just do some ad hoc treatments there. I'll come back to that later. Uh, the O stars on steroids which we uh, sometimes call them the W and H stars, the Warfare stars and then this big green thing where actually no track is going because in single star evolution you simply don't predict stars to go there. Uh, the helium stars which uh, is, a, is a big thing in terms of binary evolution because we are we have numerous of them predicted by binary evolution. We have a few candidates now and those candidates that we have actually look different than the bulk of stuff predicted. So we have lots of open questions on why they are not going there and some of this is probably related to winds, a lot of this is probably related to mass transfer, uh, lots of open questions that we probably want to talk more about later. So measuring winds of hot massive stars is actually not trivial because uh, the mass loss is not a nice fundamental thing that you can get out like a temperature or a, or a mass to a certain degree. So what we really need is usually spectral coverage. For strong winds you can also do radio excess measurements which is a slightly more direct method. It's not completely direct, there are still some assumptions but very reasonable assumptions allow you to, to measure this relatively directly but for, for the bulk of stars um, you need things like that. You either need optical spectroscopy and that if you're lucky in a uh, case in a Wolfram Yeastar you have tons of emission lines that gives you already a decent idea uh, of the, the winds of these stars. So for example from the, from the width of these lines you can get a first estimate of the, of the wind speed. But on the other hand if you only use optical ones you can also underestimate the total velocity. So what, what you really ideally want to have is UV spectroscopy where you can find these beautiful p profiles. And then from this trough of the p profiles you get some idea about the wind speed and if you have that and then you model all the stuff for your spectrum, you get uh, the mass loss rates. There are lots of minor things that I'm glossing over here, but that's basically the, uh, yes. So to just to uh, clarify what uh, 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 I understand, so when it's a radio access measurement, is, are you looking at like the shock interaction? Uh, so uh, I, I should have put a plot here, but okay. If, if you have the SED of a black body and you have a strong wind, you will have an excess in the infrared and radio. So basically your, your wavelength dependency will be uh, weaker than what you expect from a pure black body. And this is an excess due to free free emission. And simply by assuming that you can forget about other opacities and you only assume free free opacity, you can, uh, you can do a relatively analytic estimate of the mass loss rate there. There are uh, two seminal papers, the slightly more famous one is by Wright and Barlow 1975 and that really gives you a formula. So you need to make some assumptions about uh, um, the gown factor there uh, and then eventually about the clumping of the wind but if you have any handle on getting that you really get your mass loss if you know the terminal velocity. So that's it's one of the things, so ideally you really want to have something like that for the terminal velocity and then if you have the radio measurement you can do that. But really that works only where the, where the excess from the free free emission is significant. So the typical target for that is Wolfram-Yi stars or supergiants in the galaxy. Uh, but in the context of gravitational waves for example we want to get down to lower metallicity and then no chance. Yeah, you, you don't have that, that kind of thing. Okay, so Bottom line here is observed mass loss rates really have an unavoidable model dependence so we want to get models as good as possible to deal with that stuff. Now in order to, to do this we need to think a bit about the driving uh, uh, of hot star winds. The fundamental uh, principle is that in hot stars uh, 
we have uh, a momentum transfer from photons to matter, so this is called radiation pressure dominated, and actually it's the, uh, the line opacity, I'll come back to, uh, to that in a second. The good thing is that this is mainly a radial process with a radial net outflow because our, our photons are coming here from this hot star, then they are absorbed somewhere in the wind. They are re-emitted in an arbitrary direction and that cancels kind of out so that you have this net outflow. Uh, and this is subject to instabilities. You might have heard about things like line-driven instabilities, that hot star winds are in intrinsically unstable. But the good thing is these spectra that I showed you, they wouldn't look like that if they would vary on a very short time scale. So overall, with some wiggles here and there, these spectra will look the same if I take the same, sp uh, sp uh, um, the same spectrum in a year or in 10 years from now. That means that the time averaged solutions are more or less stationary and that's very good because that helps us a lot in modeling these stars. And so we can describe the radiative acceleration, for example, here in this 1D parameterization. We can rewrite this slightly, introduce something that, I call, uh, that we call the flux weighted mean opacity and then divide this by the gravity so we get the three main wind defining quantities, which is the luminosity, the mass and this, op uh, this flux weighted mean opacities. Now, Opacities are extremely important for hot star winds and the main two sources are here atomic bound bound transitions which lead basically to the spectral imprint here. This is really the light that has been absorbed to drive the wind of the star. So this is what is missing here in this trough. Um, but there are also other opacities to take into account. Bound free, the free free that we just talked about in the context of the, of the radio observations and then the free electron, the, the Thomson scattering. And out of those four, the two main things are really the free electrons, so the Thomson scattering, and then the bound-bound transition. And the first one is conveniently described as kind of an effective reduction of gravity. Um, the problem is this one you cannot do, well, formally you can, but it's actually a depth-dependent force initiating the wind. And I'm trying to illustrate this here in this, in this plot where I show the distance from the star in this uh, double logarithmic plot here. So um, it's kind of a unusual coordinate for some, but it allows me to both uh, highlight the inner parts of the wind as well as the huge outer part of the wind without losing the information on one of them. Um, and then on the vertical scale we have the acceleration normalized by gravity, so this is kind of the, the zero line is, the, the, uh, e uh, is equal to one, so where the acceleration balances gravity, and we see that at a certain point, which is here the uh, approximately the sonic point, this is surpassed and then the wind is getting supersonic. So we have the total radiation pressure here, and this is uh, um, made out of these two main ingredients, the Thomson scattering here, which is more or less constant, at least in a typical old star. And then on top of that, we have the line acceleration. So all of this is the acceleration due to lines, and this is why I wrote there that this is the depth depending force initiating the wind, because it really makes the difference. Yeah? If you have Thomson scattering, it takes you very close to this limit, but you need this depth-dependent line acceleration to really make it uh, and launch the wind. All right, I already mentioned this flux-weighted uh, opacity. Yeah, it's slightly different from the Rosalind opacity, and this difference is what's making here the difference that you are able to launch a wind. If you calculate these models, you can also calculate the Rosalind opacity, and you really see that once you get here, in the outer wind, you are easily an order of magnitude away. This one is increasing, this one is decreasing. So even if you do very detailed hydro simulations, for example, the, the simulations from uh, Yang Fei Jiang or so, which are super detailed in what they can do in terms of 3D, but they still use Rosselin opacities, which I don't blame them because it's the thing that you have available for these things. Yeah? This thing you need detailed frequency dependent transfer and you don't want to put this in a complex 3D simulations because that's already killing you in terms of other numerics. Yeah? Um, here we are doing 1D models so we can afford to do the detailed 3D, uh, the, the detailed radiative transfer but then on the other hand we are missing out on uh, a lot of the 3D effects in these, in these models. So why are these things so different? Essentially the opacity the line opacity can be used again and again due to the Doppler shift. So due to the uh, increased Doppler shift, your individual line profile will shift in uh, uh, the distance when you get further away from the star and thereby you can sweep up a lot of the radiation at different things. And so you get these nice Pisuni profiles. Here is, uh, by the way, this was the OB star again. And if you look at the Warfaye star, it looks even more complex because you have this double bump uh, structure. But in principle, it's the same thing. The only difference is that you launch your wind usually here much deeper, which means that you are closer 
to LTE, which means you're also closer to Rosselau opacity where you launch the wind and then only if you're already far out in the wind, you start these things to get significantly different. Yeah. Remind me at least what is the flux, what is the flux mean opacity? And is it like different than the Planck mean, for example? Yeah, it's, uh, it's slightly different. The Planck mean is essentially if you, um, if you do this integral, yeah, and then divide it by the integral of the flux, then you get the flux weighted mean opacity. So, yeah, okay, I, I, I should have probably included one more step, but yeah, just divide this by the integral over f, and then you get the flux weighted mean. If you want the Planck mean opacity, you just replace f by the Planck function. So the only difference is that this is the true flux, which of course you need to know from a detailed model to calculate. Yeah, the Planck one is much easier because you don't need all of this detailed stuff. You can just calculate it when you know something about your opacities. Yeah. Okay, so just to clarify that, if I want to simplify things, I just replace f by, by, by the Planck function. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, if you're interested, I, I can show you some plots on how much that differs, uh, because we can easily calculate this out of the models as well. Uh, it will make a difference. It will already be a bit better than using uh, the Rosselon, but still, uh, ideally, you want to have this, because this is the only thing that really describes your wind driving, and this is where it gets complicated. And one of the goals actually in a, in a future project is to, to find some way of tabulating that so that people can use it instead of the classical Rosse law. But it's, uh, it's high dimensional very quickly. And so we need to think of a clever way of what to provide in order to really be useful for, for you guys, for example. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right, uh, I have put a bit uh, background stuff about CAK. Not sure if you're interested too much in that. This is mainly to, to, to get a bit uh, out of the background of, of where this comes from in the, uh, um, in the classical concept of radiation-driven winds. The, the point is, this is valid for all stars, but it's not valid once the winds get more optically thick and once we go to Wolf-Rayet stars. Um, but to motivate it, the total opacity, these things are easy, the bound free, free free and Thompson, the line things are hard. So the CAK approach is, let's just get rid of these things as we saw in the, in the previous plot, they are not important for the typical O star anyhow. And then we just write this as a factor of this very easy to calculate Thompson thing. And that gives you uh, something that we call, uh, or that uh, Custer et al called uh, the force multiplier. Uh, here's a way to calculate that and the, the elegant thing is then, okay, we don't, or the typical user don't needs to worry about this thing. You just can approximate this with a simple power law. And you have two parameters, k and alpha, all done, looks great, right? Now I know my, my line acceleration, I use some tabulated value for alpha and delta and then I'm happy and that's it. And this is indeed what, uh, um, yeah, I'm skipping here over the Sobolev, which is intrinsical, but this is indeed what the typical simulation uh, that is time dependent or that's multidimensional uses to approximate the radiative acceleration because this is the only way to get a fast uh, answer on these things. So it's an easy and fast implementation. The problem is that these approximations at some point break down and this can be important if they break down in a situation where you are really uh, requiring something better than that. Um, and the first example is actually the plot that I showed you. I cheated a bit. I said all of this is line acceleration. Actually, this part here between the uh, green and the purple is already uh, bound-free acceleration. So even in this example, which here is the, the, the infamous uh, Zeta Pappes model, um, we have a bit of additional terms that I just gloss over. They are not large in this case, but they make a difference and they can actually be painful if they are too strong here in the inner part if you want to calculate these models, but that's just a, a detail. So what, we can, what can we do to go beyond CAK? The first thing is we can just use empirical recipes. Uh, so something like I showed in the beginning, if you analyze lots of stars, if you analyze their wind parameters, you get an empirical idea. Or you go beyond this by modeling winds either with Monte Carlo radiative transfer or the stuff that I'm doing in my group, which is co-moving frame. Uh, radiative transfer modeling, so this relatively detailed 1D stuff. To briefly introduce the Monte Carlo concept, we can follow their photon packages through the wind, which is great because we can include things like multiple scattering, so a photon can, scatter, can be scattered multiple times in the wind. There's no physics forbidding the photon from doing that. 
but it's, uh, it's something in inherent to the CAK, for example, that you assume that your photon is just scattered once in the wind and that's it. And essentially by uh, protocoling how much uh, energy the, the photon loses, you then get an idea on the luminosity between where you start your photon and where your photon uh, leaves your model, and you can co co connect that uh, if you know the terminal velocity, for example, you just assume that, or you just assume that you have some scaling between escape and terminal velocity, and then you can easily calculate your mass loss rate. Uh, this is the background of, of Jorik Wink's well-known 2000-2001 mass loss recipe. It's all uh, from these kinds of models. Um, in this simple approach, it's only globally energy consistent. So the problem with, this, uh, uh, with these prescriptions is that you have somewhere your opacity, but you're not really sure if your opacity is actually there to launch the wind or if your opacity is just there to accelerate to get a faster wind, which might be weaker in terms of the mass loss rate. And then this treatment can be improved a bit for local consistency. Uh, uh, I don't get into the details here. And this uh, kind of Monte Carlo studies are also handy for, for multi-D treatments, uh, although it gets computationally expensive very quickly. Then. The alternative then is uh, the co-moving frame, which is essentially kind of a brute force solution of that integral, um, where, you, where you do a lot of numerical discretization and uh, you then uh, are, are left with an initial value problem uh, where you then only need to blue bound frequency, so you assume some frequency edge to say, okay, there I don't have any line flux anymore, and then you integrate uh, in an expanding uh, atmosphere over the whole uh, frequency. Uh, that has severe advantages. You don't need any of these uh, approximations. You have multiple scattering included. Your can line overlapping is, is quite easy to treat. And you get a detailed calculation of this radiative transfer, which is nice because you can then do uh, proper hydrodynamic studies with it. Um, the downside is it takes a few minutes on a really fast core. So for, for one single radiative transfer. So to really, really get these kind of models uh, um, you require hours to days, and this is why uh, it's not uh, used in a, in a more uh, a wide uh, parameter studies and we're just starting to get into, into these things. Because it allows you to do these le uh, detailed local solutions, you get these insights on radiative driving, so these kind of plots that I showed you are all done from, um, from these detailed uh, co-moving frame atmosphere models, and I'm coming back here to the supergiant model, you can even break this down into the individual contributions of elements. And this is where it then starts to get interesting in terms of, for example, describing mass loss rates as functions and to see where these things depend on. Yeah? So, for example, here in the Zeta Pappes, we saw that here where the unity line is crossed, we have the Thomson and then we have the iron uh, uh, line opacity as the leading line opacity to add to that. And then in the outer wind, we have tons of other elements taking over. We have, uh, for example, oxygen, we have nitrogen, uh, but we also have things like argon that are not obvious uh, because in the spectrum, you wouldn't see any argon line at all, but the opacity is simply uh, strong enough of this argon ion to contribute uh, the third most part here in this wind stratification. Now you can break this further down into individual ions. I spoil you the, yeah. So if if the wind composition didn't like, have less argon, uh, had a different composition from solar composition, yeah. then, would that like, significantly affect the dosage? That's a good question. So the, the first thing it would affect here is the terminal velocity because the argon is only coming out in the, in the outer winds, so the terminal velocity would be reduced. But there is an indirect effect because of the density effect that this can have on the overall wind stratification that it might also affect the mass loss rate. So it, 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 it depends, but the, the leading effect here would probably be a reduction of the terminal velocity. On the other hand, if you don't include certain elements, you can always underestimate the terminal velocity. The problem in, in practice is if you run these models, uh, so the, the things you might have seen the paper from Robin Björklund, who does a very similar technique, and the problem there is they get too high terminal velocities. But you know that you need to account for certain elements, so you cannot, you cannot just say, ah, just remove my argon and that's it. Um, the problem then is really what is the solution? Am I uh, underestimating something? Am I missing a certain effect? Yeah, so there, there are still various open questions, but um, indeed it's one of the things that I also have on my long uh, wish list is to try non-standard alpha to iron thing, uh, abundances because those are uh, 
effects that might matter. We don't know for sure which and in, in, in what regime, but it's it's something that we have on our radar that, that they could. Because I was just wondering, because um, it's such an only problem, like yeah. maybe it's just a self replacement solution. Just it's, it's very, very hard to estimate before putting something in a model how much of a difference it makes. And also these things don't scale linear with the abundance. I mean, in some range they sometimes do, but the argon abundance, this is just solar argon, so I, I don't know the abundance from the from top of my head, but I don't know, 10 to the minus 5 or something? Yeah, so it's, it's a tiny bit that you would think makes no difference. And actually all the time we just use these models for spectral analysis, we never put in argon. Why bother, right? But once you start doing this kind of modeling, you need to wonder uh, about argon. You also need to wonder about, yeah. <laughs> okay. You also need to wonder about all of the other elements up until the iron group. And actually one of the things I'm a bit worried about in the case of the wolf Ayestas that I want to tackle is I want to worry about the high nickel ions that I so far don't have in the models. Yeah. Yeah, argon is, I think, is fairly uncertain in the sun. That's a big problem. Yeah. That's true, that's true. I, I, and, and this would make all the difference. I mean, here for Zeta Pappis, not so much. But um, do I have the one for the Wolf Rayet here? Not sure. Uh, no, these are just two more O stars. But if you do the one for the Wolf Rayet, actually Argon 5 is extremely important there. So if you, if you underestimate or overestimate that by a factor of 2 in the Wolf Rayet model, might already affect your mass loss rate a bit. So it's, it's all of these, these nitty gritty things. It's a lot of the uncertainties in the atomic data that all impact the kind of stuff that we are getting out of these models. So uh, I, I don't say I don't trust my models. I trust a lot the trends that I'm going out. But the absolute scale is, I think, something we really need to gauge with observations as good as we can. And then we can say, OK, now we have some good data points. And then all the, the complex uh, shapes of these things we can get out of such models if we uh, use a consistent set of atomic data. So can yeah. you turn it around and say, well, we, we require this amount of argon in order to make the wind model work? In some sense, yes. Uh, the, the problem is, and now one of my students, Rul, is actually trying to, to do this for, for hot wolf stars, and the other one has just started to, to try it for, for stars like Pisigny, so for the, for the cool end, so to say, of the strong mass loss regime. And there we'll have to see, because indeed the, the first models that we are going to uh, uh, calculate have a problem that is opposite to what Robbie Björklund got, that we underestimate the terminal velocity unless we, we go to really high clumping factors that are not observed. Uh, and so tuning things like the argon abundance might be one way to get out of there, or at least saying there is some missing opacity, whether this is argon, whether this is nickel, is of course uh, uh, hard, to, hard to pin down. But, but having something like a, like a Fuchs factor on certain opacities is something that we might get out of uh, doing individual stars, or at least a few ones to see where are patterns, where we fit or don't fit, and is there like a constant offset for certain elements, or is it really spread out all over? Okay, these two things are just uh, different examples for different OB type stars to, to show you that this pattern is not at all constant. Yeah, so if you remember here, Zeta Puppis and all of these have the same color scale. So you don't need to look at the details, but what you see is that different colors are leading in, in each of the diagrams, right? And that means suddenly here it's uh, silicon 4, here it's iron 3. And that means that for each of these regimes, you are essentially back to square one. So of course we can, we can see common things like iron helping in launching the wind, which is great because the mass loss rate at least seems to depend mostly on iron. But everything in the outer wind, terminal velocity predictions, are super, super complex and probably uncertain to a good degree because you always need to worry about all of these different ions and then once you go from a 40 to a 25 kilokelvin star which is not a lot on the global picture but it's it's very different in what really does the wind driving all right i've just put this here for later discussions I'm, i don't will take you through all of the uh, of the equations but essentially there are a few uh, typical equations that are used in the in the field uh, um, the, the Kudritsky cooking recipe, which is essentially this idea of the CAK version that you have some tabulated parameters. 
Um, then uh, Yorick's 2000-2001 uh, uh, Monte Carlo calculation, which I would say is kind of the current standard that's in the models. Um, and then uh, for, the, uh, for the strip stars, there's the only uh, actual recipe available so far is the Wink 2017. How good that actually is, nobody knows yet. At least it's something that we have available, right? Um, the absence of empirical results really to gauge that is, is a big thing and, and we are hoping to make some progress on that soon. Uh, but it, it doesn't look like an easy thing uh, to tackle simply because we have so few observations and each of the objects that some people put forward, uh, other people might have arguments why this is not a typical star and why this is not a good observational benchmark. So it's, it's quite hard. Then from the co-moving frame side, we have the papers by Robin Björklund, who unfortunately now uh, left, left the field to do a different kind of science. Uh, so um, we're trying to, to follow uh, this up, but it, it will take some time. Um, those models predict weaker winds than Yorix. Interestingly, also no bi-stability jump, which is a big effect in the uh, stellar uh, um, uh, evolution models where you have a jump at around 25 kilokelvin to higher mass loss rates. Uh, Yorick attributes that to an iron opacity uh, uh, switch in the outer part. That is definitely real. The question is whether it always leads to a jump in the mass loss rate. It's also one of the things that um, one of my PhD students will try to follow up with these models. It might simply be that we see this jump when we are close to the Eddington limit, but for stars where we are further away, we simply might not see this jump. Um, the terminal velocities, I just mentioned it, are too high. That's the question, does that come with also a too low m dot because these things are coupled in the solution topology? Um, the general trend is definitely there, also from, for example, Yuji Kritichka's models. But on the other hand, we simply might miss certain 3D effects that help us launching the wind, which then leads to an underestimation of m dot, which would then in turn leads to an overestimation of the terminal velocity. Yeah, uh, and the big Impact, of course, with the OB star mass loss rates here is can you do self-stripping of a star? So can you get here, at least at galactic metallicity with the wolf star, or do you always end up somewhere here in the red-yellowish regime and that's it and you don't really get here without uh, having interactions in a binary system? Yeah. Um, at lower metallicity, to be honest, the OB star winds probably don't make a difference. Yeah, the question is, where is this point where they don't start to make a difference anymore, at least for the mass loss. For other things like uh, uh, removing angular momentum, this can be a different story. Okay, uh, empirical things. Uh, we have a few studies from, from Varsha's 2019 paper. We now, I mentioned the x shoot u collaboration already, so we have uh, optical uh, data uh, uh, in addition to the uh, Ulysses data that comes in, and this uh, collaboration is called X shoot U, X shooting Ulysses, uh, which will extend this significantly. We have, uh, this is just exemplary, some, some recent papers, for example, by Sarah Brands in the LMC, uh, by, by Matthew uh, Rickard in the, in the uh, uh, NGC 336 in the SMC. The general trend is always there. This is, this is Yorick's recipe. It's lower, but how much lower? Here is, for example, Robbins. The best uh, for, for Sarah's results are here more like Yirji Kritichka's uh, things, but you see there is significant scatter, there are significant error bars, and this is just m dot l. What you ideally want is a bit more complex than that and a bit more detailed approximation to not just consider the luminosity, but also consider things like the mass or the temperature because they all play a role in uh, how much um, you actually can drive the wind. Okay, brief things, red supergiant winds. Uh, this is essentially an extended version of what I presented at the, uh, uh, at the conference um, two weeks uh, ago. So uh, I don't want to go into all of the details, but essentially the, the standard uh, picture here is that we uh, have not uh, radiation driven wind in terms of line opacities, but in terms of dust opacities for which you need uh, a slow uh, two-step process that comes essentially from AGB winds, which is called PEDRO, pulsation enhanced dust driven outflow. So we need first the pulsation to lift the material to a, a radius where dust can form, and then the dust has sufficient opacity to be radiated away. Um, there are simulations to, to demonstrate that. There are, for example, these detailed simulations here, which are not even the dust ones, it's just the, just the pulsations where you see uh, 
uh, these, these nice uh, outflows, but so far we don't have first principle recipes for the mass loss rates. Um, so the typical things that are used in this regime are, for example, De Jaja or uh, Nie uh, I, I always butcher that probably, Nievenhusen and De Jaja, uh, which is the same data in a different parameterization. And the thing is that these two things were never intended for red supergiants. They were tried off in the, in the 1980s, done as a catch-all of massive stars in the HRD. And then bit by bit, we replaced that by newer recipes. And this is what left, is kind of left, yeah, in the red supergiant regime. Um, it has been used because if you brutally average over the evolution, it seems to be okay-ish in giving you certain numbers. And so this is why it's, uh, it's in use, even though uh, it's kind of outdated in a certain sense that it's not benchmarked on the actual stars itself alone. Here's, for example, a paper from Moron and Jocelyn uh, reviewing that. There's lots of ad hoc introduction of metallicity scaling because these things here, Van Loon is dust rich, which is giving you a higher mass loss rate. Um, none of this really gives you a metallicity dependence. And so people have just assumed something. Yeah? For example, when, when JJ started this in his models, he just said, OK, we use the 0.5 because for hot stars, we also use the 0.5. We just use the 0.5 everywhere. Um, this one, I don't even have a clue why they pick 0.7, probably also on some number statistic and saying it gives me the right red to blue supergiants in my models or so. But this is more like post hoc. Yeah? You say, I want to have this kind of population, so I'm adjusting my, uh, uh, my numbers to, to do that. But you can also, with a good uh, argument, say there's no z-scaling because if you believe that this is dust-driven, the dust is from self-produced carbon, so at low metallicity I should still have the carbon, so why shouldn't my, my mechanism work the same at low metallicity? Yeah. So this is a, a good argument, and actually this is the default in the standard MESA implementation. So if you run a MESA model at very low metallicity, if your star goes to the red, we'll still lose tons of mass because it has this De Yaha implemented. Yeah? Well, like I said, at uh, low metallicity, you might start even earlier with your dust because you have less oxygen to bind it. That's a good, that's a good point, uh, but this is not actually reflected in any of these things. Yeah? Not even in the, in the MESA where it's just a hard cut, I think, at 10,000. And I think at solar metallicity, 10,000 is too hot for dust. So the, the point where you actually switch is something that could be done much better in these kind of evolutionary calculations. Whether it matters or not, of course, depends if your star spends a lot of time there. If it just crosses it fast, probably nobody cares. Yeah. Um, okay, so some new efforts here, for example, from Emma Biza uh, has recently measured um, or tried to measure dust, which is always an indirect measure, and then you need this gas, uh, gas to dust ratio. So uh, th this, these efforts are already um, very detailed, but still come with certain uncertainties that, that are hard to get rid of. Um, in this uh, st study, they get much lower mass loss rates. On the other hand, Dylan Key, uh, now in Hawaii, postdoc tried a semi-analytic concept with a turbulent pressure approach that doesn't even require dust. And then, as you can see here, over six orders of magnitude, has a super steep dependence. Um, this is also highly experimental, but gives the interesting opportunity that maybe you have kind of a runaway mass loss at the end of the red supergiant. So when you tip into a relatively high a luminosity regime, which might might align with the thing that we see some of the dust enshrouded red supergiants there. And that maybe is a good uh, idea how to explain why the typical red supergiants that we observe have this relatively low mass loss rates, but we still have some effect at the end that would then make a difference in terms of stellar evolution. All right, coming to one of my favorites, wolf Wins. wins. Um, of course, wolf stars at first are a spectroscopic definition. Yeah? Something that looks like this is essentially a wolf star. That's, that's the definition. So if you see these emission lines in the optical, um, and then they come in two main flavors, the classical ones, which are core helium burning stars, and then this very massive WNH stars at the upper end of the main sequence that we like to call O stars on steroids sometimes, but which are much less uh, evolved and probably uh, most of them seem to be core hydrogen burning. I, I say that with some grain of salt here and there. Um, 
the point is that we now know from the modeling very good that why this kind of uh, appearance starts and that's simply because your star is getting closer to the Eddington limit. And that can be translated into a maximum L to M ratio uh, that is slightly different due to the different uh, uh, free electrons for hydrogen free and hydrogen rich stars. But once your star gets sufficiently close to this limit, your winds start to get much stronger and you pop up, you get this strong outflow and then you get automatically this kind of emission line spectra. So I will first talk about classical wolf rayet stars. What happens then? Your wind is so dense that a lot of the radiation field is simply absorbed. So even if I would have a perfect black body at tau 100 or something, I then remove a lot of the radiation and a significant part actually in the outer wind as you can see here and then suddenly the spectrum looks very different from what the intrinsic stellar spectrum looked like. All right, um, I'll skip over this. Essentially we have a breakdown of the CAK concept. So what has been used in the field so far are empirically mass loss rates. Uh, typical ones are ironically Wolf Reiner's uh, 1995 uh, recipe. Uh, although there have been newer studies, it has somehow sticked in the field. Uh, Nugis and Lamas 2000, or you can use some empirical ones like the ones from Reiner from LMC and SMC uh, WN stars. Um, it's then very common to, to use uh, Yorex uh, um, Monte Carlo uh, motivated uh, Z dependence just to have something. Uh, and there are some uh, empirical uh, or semi empirical approaches by Sung Chul where he basically tuned these recipes to match the observed population. So argued why one should use this factor and that factor. And that gives some decent agreement here and there, but it also has some complications. Ask me uh, later if you want to know more about this. Um, in any case, it's, it's very hard to, to say this is or that is exactly the best model because all of these models are, uh, these empirical ones are essentially derived by this. Yeah? You analyze a bunch of stars you put them in a plane like this one and then you do some fit then. And whether this really describes all of these stars is a very big question mark. And the, the even more problematic thing is whether you can extrapolate this to lower metallicities or whatever. Yeah. What this is actually very good for, on the other hand, is gorging relations in stellar evolution. So uh, this year there were two papers by Aaron Artland uh, who analyzed WO stars, so, so very, very highly evolved wolf stars that already show strong oxygen lines. And for a long time there was the idea that these stars are so highly evolved that they have very high oxygen fractions at their surface. And what she found with only two stars, so we are trying to do more, but so far she did two stars, um, is that the oxygen abundance is actually lower than expected. It's still enriched, but it's lower. And that suddenly gives you a very interesting handle on this carbon to oxygen nuclear reaction rate because usually you have, you have no chance or few chances to observe that. But in these WO stars compared to earlier uh, compared to WC stars, which are, uh, yeah, uh, have, a, have a more carbon dominated spectrum, you can compare this and then you can put this on tracks and you can adjust your rate as long as, uh, uh, until you fit that. And they have done this in, this in the second paper, played a bit with it and saying, okay, this rate is probably lower and that has severe implications, not just for uh, uh, opacities driving the wind, but really, for example, uh, how big does my oxygen core in the star uh, get? And that has a uh, an effect on pair instability and that has an effect, for example, on the so-called mass gap or the upper black hole mass gap. So, Suddenly, th these kind of very weird exotic stars are a very important handle for lots of uncertainties in, in uh, evolution. Unfortunately, we know less than a dozen of, the, uh, of these stars. Yeah? So it's, uh, it's complicated. Yeah. The other problems are that uh, this would even uh, equally be affected if you had different amount of mixing, semi-convection, yeah. occasional mixing. So yeah. This has yeah. been looked at in literature a lot. So unfortunately, don't get it out directly because there's uh, only if you knew all the other things that went in your modeling, which we don't understand. That's, that's true, that's true. The, the good thing is, I think here from the WC and WOs, at least you don't expect that the mixing within this stage is that strong. But of course, I'm not an expert in this kind of modeling. But I would expect that at least looking only at the late stages, you probably can, can say, okay, this kind of effects are a bit minor. But yeah, I, I'm not a stellar evolution expert on that.
so to speak, step in. So if the WO stars are not like off oxygen and really stuff, what's the difference between the WO? I mean, the, 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 formally it's a spectroscopic classification, so you have a WO once your uh, 3811 oxygen 6 feature is stronger than a certain critical value, and you see it immediately. You see a strong oxygen emission line in these stars that, that gives them the WO classification. Um, when you actually analyze them, they are further evolved, but when I, for example, did a very rough analysis on a WO star, I put in 40% oxygen or so. Yeah, 40% carbon, 40% oxygen, and then I get a typical WO spectrum. Now in this analysis, they need, oh, don't quote me on the numbers, I need to look it up a bit later, but much less than that, 10, 15 maybe, and they had about 50% carbon. So usually in a standard uh, rate, standard mixing model, you would never get more than uh, 40, 45 ish percent carbon surface abundance because then your oxygen would overtake that. Now that we see stars that have that, we know that at least something with the rates and with the mixing is not right in the typical assumptions. So yeah. In the same analysis, what's the fraction in the WC stars? Um, I think 50 carbon and maybe 5% oxygen or so. We, I, I have the paper on the laptop. I can just, yeah. So all of these stars are highly evolved. Don't get me wrong. But of course, the WO stars are still a bit further. And it's a difference if you have 15% or 5% oxygen, because that really tells you something. With oxygen at the surface, this cannot come from, I don't know, some pollution from a neighbor. So this is really where you know that, that uh, nuclear reactions have been at work and then have been mixed out of this material. OK, uh, lots, of popula uh, lots of problems. Let's skip over all of the detailed things. Uh, what I did so far for the WN stage is calculating. Uh, now, I, thought, uh, I, I told you that these models are complicated. So this is basically the work of a year of calculations. Um, WN type models, in this case, all with the same inner temperature, so to say at different metallicities. And this is the picture that you get at mass loss versus luminosity. So um, one can put this into a slightly crude axis. Yeah, this is double logarithmic here. But interestingly, it gets linear then in the dense wind regime with a breakdown. And so this is why I did that. Um, it, it gets even more interesting in terms of metallicity if you divide m dot by the terminal velocity. They start to align all along these these uh, things, yeah, there are a few exceptions for very low metallicities, but probably that's, that's a density uh, effect there. But essentially, you have a linear relation here, and that leads to this kind of recipe that looks a bit crude, but that you can systematically sketch like this, that essentially you have uh, an optically thick regime where you are linearly scaling with this quantity, and then you have a metallicity-dependent breakdown here, and these curves also uh, align with this m dot versus v infinity as constant. So this means that this kind of uh, mass loss is a, is a really dense density effect. Once your density is high enough, you get this kind of scaling. Sorry, but this yeah. parameter, is that something that is essentially a free parameter in your models, or, or is that something that, that's uh, calibrated? No, no, that's, that's coming out of the model. So it's L over m times uh, uh, an ionization parameter, oh, very roughly. Okay. Yeah. So I could I could put yeah. Yeah. So I could I could put L to M there. The point is there is still this Q ion parameter. So it, it makes a small difference. Um, but the Python script I provided also lets you input L and M and then it, it guesses the ionization parameter, which is reasonable if you assume that these kind of stars are fully ionized. Of course, in reality, they aren't. You still have different ionizations for the metals, but for hydrogen and helium, which make the bulk of this WN models. For WCs, that's already eh, with 40% carbon. It's, it's, not so, uh, it's, it's not exactly the same factor, but for WN stars, it's OK. Um, the, the important point of this breakdown is, of course, that you have much lower mass loss at lower metallicity than any of these uh, um, power law types of, of descriptions. So the, that's, that's why I'm here concluding that the current recipes are insufficient. Interestingly, also, once you get into this high mass regime, 
you're actually very flat in scaling. It's just 0.3. So it's just a factor of 2 for a factor of 10 in metallicity. That's, that's not a lot. Uh, but it tells you probably why, for example, the WC stars in the LMC don't look so different from the early type WC stars in the galaxy. Because they are not scaling dramatically once you are in this regime of high mass loss. Now here's that illustrated. Yeah? So if you're closer to the adding limit at even higher masses, then you can maintain this mass loss down to lower metallicity. Um, and that nicely, at least qualitatively, explains these different breakdowns of the population. So these are all the WN stars uh, analyzed at Milky Way, LMC, SMC. And we really see there is some kind of lower luminosity. And that gets higher and higher and higher because it corresponds to higher and higher masses at lower metallicity. OK, let's not talk about the mathematics. Now, these models are already quite nice, but they were calculated at one fixed, I, I called it inner temperature here, this T star. Now, this year I started a radius study and I thought, ah, it's a minor effect. But once you start looking closer at things, it's actually a bit stronger than you think. Yeah? There is a dependency, which is in the end not too surprising, but it's R, the critical radius, so this, basically the sonic point, to the power of third. So it's, it's quite a lot. Uh, and it means that probably we have to slightly shift our, uh, our recipe a bit. And there are also uh, hard boundaries saying that because you have this opacity that goes down again from the iron bump, you cannot drive winds in all of these regimes. Here is one where we don't really see the hard boundaries. So if we then combine this, for example, with Lucas' uh, stellar structure models, we could say instead of the 140 that are assumed, we would now rather assume the 130, and that's about 0.2 dex, roughly, in mass loss rate higher. But it depends on the individual mass regime. Then another thing that makes a difference is the abundances. And also that effect is not too dramatic within the HD atmospheres, but it's quite pronounced if you compare it to what the typical recipes that are on the market predict at the moment. Yeah? So this is uh, uh, essentially an unpublished sequence of models. Um, here, there is still hydrogen at the surface. Then we are reaching the WN stage here. And then we are increasing carbon. So we are going through the WC stage. And what we see is that, all, by the way, all of the stellar parameters are constant here. So uh, stellar structure would even uh, pronounce that further because if you have hydrogen on the surface you should have larger radii and that should help your, your mass loss. But assuming that there is no radius effect, you would have an increased mass loss during, uh, during the hydrogen state, not because of the line intensity but because of the addition of free electrons. While if you use for example Nugis and Lamas and also this, this way of, of how Wolf Reiner's uh, recipe is typically implemented, would tell you exactly the opposite. It would tell you that the mass loss goes up at the end when you lose the hydrogen, I know I have only two minutes. I'll try to wrap it up. Um, the HD atmospheres tell you the opposite. And then for the WC stage, you even get a big bounce here for the Nugis and Lamas recipe. Here you are essentially constant. Instead, you get a small reduction. And that's, again, due to the loss of free electron opacity here. OK, so I'm, I'm glossing over this. Very massive stars, another important thing. Don't have time to talk much about it. There are various recipes on the market. Nobody really knows. Um, yeah. <laughs> so lots of dependencies. Um, LBVs, another big question mark, which I think might be related to this effect because we have this radius dependence. Um, currently, mostly ad hoc treatments. Uh, this is my summary. Um, my group, as I said, uh, we now get uh, two more people, Cormac and, and Elisa. And just to give you some idea of what we are working on, um, Ruhl, uh, I mentioned him already, is producing a spectra of classic Wolfayers. Matthäus is uh, doing the very late blue supergiant, blue hypergiant regime. Uh, together with uh, uh, Gautam, who is a PhD student of Yorick, we are trying to get a handle on these very massive stars. Um, then Varsha, mostly from observational side, but we're also starting, starting modeling efforts on that, is uh, doing the stripped stars. Elisa will start in January on metal poor massive stars in the Magellanic Bridge, which is a very new, interesting location to get metal poor stars without having to go to low metallicity dwarf galaxies. Um, colliding wind binaries is something that Cormac is working in his first year on. 
And then we have another open postdoc position to continue some of the efforts together with John Sundquist on the 3D simulations, uh, which give us very interesting insights. They seem to confirm the general trends of the 1D, but they will help us a lot to get a lot of the uncertain parameters and gorging of the 1D models from the 3D simulation. So with that, I think I'll just uh, leave it here, and uh, I'm happy to take further questions or discuss stuff later today or tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I was very curious about the, one of the last things you mentioned, which was the, the WM stars uh, and the fact that um, so my naive assumption had, all, had been that you know this based one. on things like News and Lammers and, and Hammond et al. and so on, yeah. right? That that if I have a high luminosity uh, uh, star that's burning to in the orbit, so there's some hydrogen around it. That generally speaking, if it's in a binary, because I'm often mm -hmm. interested in binaries, right? The you know I want to keep on the hydrogen for as long as possible because the moment I remove the hydrogen, that's when the really strong winds kick in <laughs> uh, and uh, mass d d gets depleted very rapidly. So if I want the star to be able to build up a uh, mm -hmm. you know large core, produce a large remnant, etc., I want to keep on the hydrogen at all costs and not remove it uh, too quickly through binary motion, for example. But you're actually telling me the opposite that if I that if I uh, you know, if I keep on the hydrogen for too long, I have stronger winds. I, I want to get rid of the hydrogen, right? Is that is that too too? It it depends on the balance. It really depends uh, how much hydrogen in terms of masses you have there. So if uh, these models, as I say, are all for constant stellar parameters, so it means that in this case the mass of hydrogen would be negligible, but you might have a thin layer with seventy percent hydrogen. And it would boost your mass loss rate by a factor of two. Of course, if you have a you get rid of that thin layer very quickly. Exactly. That's so this is this right. is what what this is telling. Yeah. It, w once, of course, it gets complicated. Is if you say I have tw uh, twenty solar mass helium core and five solar masses of hydrogen. Yeah. What is larger, the additional gravity effect that would reduce your mass loss, or the additional boost here? Um, then there is also the the uh, structural effect that usually if you have this much hydrogen, it would take your star to the red and make it appear as a red supergiant. Yeah? All, of, all of these effects work in different directions. So I would say it's, it's very, very hard to estimate a priori what wins un uh, unless you really do detailed calculations. So what I can help you with is if you give me the structural parameters, I can tell you what the wind is. At least if it's not a red supergiant wind. But, 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 this, but what this does tell me, for example, okay, let's, let's consider a very specific case, right? Yeah. So one of the debates in literature is you know, post common envelope, right? If I, mm -hmm. if I had a, an evolved star, I stripped off the envelope, um, you know, I'm still, uh, I might end up, you know, some very simple pop since rapid yeah. models used to assume that you just get rid of the entire envelope, yeah. that's it, you just have a naked helium core, yeah. right? Okay, now, you know, more sophisticated models are suggesting that uh, you might end up with some, you know, layer of, you know, let's say, order of a solar mass, even on top of a massive core. Um, of uh, that's fairly hydrogen rich uh, mm -hmm. of, of an envelope there, right? And and then people um, have uh, suggested, okay, maybe this has a significant impact on future evolution. Like for example, the star eventually re-expands, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, etc. And uh, like Ilva Godberg had papers on, on this kind of stuff. But you're actually saying that well, it might not matter because your wind mass loss rates in such in the star are going to be so high that very quickly you get rid of of that thin envelope regardless, and so you're just back to the same place as if you had assumed uh, naively that uh, uh, post-common envelope, you just have a naked helium star. Yeah, yeah. I would, as I say, I would uh, think it makes a lot of difference depending on how much it is. Um, and uh, I, the, the point is why I haven't written this up is exactly this thing that it's, it's hard to, to, put, to pinpoint it on saying, okay, if, is it 10%, is it 20%, how, how many models do I need to, to make that robust and not just an isolated sequence of models? Um, I can't give you final answers, but I would say indeed, my, my gut feeling is if, if the layer is not too massive, it should be relatively easy to, to get rid of this hydrogen and then make your way all the way through the HRD. The question is, of course, where, where does it stop? Um, are there other effects that, that I'm ignoring here due to evolutionary constraints? But yeah, I, mean, I would. The other place, oh, right. <laughs> yeah, as Andreas said before, like, if you have a solar massive envelope there, it could well expand. And if it expands, it's a 
red star, not a blue star, so yeah. probably not using the same equipment. Usually when you go below one volume mass, so often the hydrogen envelope collapses because it blew up yeah. and ends on the cold mass. So yeah. Yeah. But if it, if it collapses, this should, this should definitely work. And the point is, as long as it's not a dust-driven wind, if it's a, I don't know, 20 kilokelvin B star, yeah, this should still be right, and it should be even more pronounced because then your radius is larger, and that should also help to make the, the material escape easier. And this is not even accounted for here. This is all constant radius. This is also, I think, relevant for, for your thoughts uh, with uh, Reinhold and whether these are going to make uh, type 2 views, for example, as opposed to common envelope systems. We sort of discussed that when we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. we briefly discussed it when you visit. Alex? Yeah, maybe it's not the seed that's going to be else. Press your hands and go back there. Ask questions. I have sort of a basic question. So, for these WNH systems, um, how, how do you know that they are. Uh, they have, uh, uh, you, say, uh, you mean the very massive stars? Burning, yeah. The very massive stars. The, the short answer is we don't. Okay. The long answer is. Um, you can make educated guesses, let me put it that way. So um, from, from pure spectroscopic, yeah, so we are, we are just for, for, for those listening, we're talking about these kind of things now. Um, the first thing is you don't know just from looking at the spectrum. What you do is if you, if you get some handle on the mass of these stars, for example, because two of them are sitting in a binary, then you can make good assumptions if you have the luminosity from the spectral analysis and some photometry, plus the masses from the binary, you have a luminosity and a mass. And then you can simply ask, is that possible for the helium burning star? Or do I need way too low luminosity that must be a hydrogen burning star because the helium burning luminosity would make this way more stronger, would, yeah, would not be able to fit this. And indeed, um, the few systems where we have masses have conflicting results. So some of them are probably hydrogen burning, others are in a stage where it say could be either or, we don't really know what these systems are, the, the, maybe even the orbital masses are not as constrained as we think, because for example we have this R144 system, and the outcome of the paper is we have no clue what, what happens there, because it's not where we expect it to be. So it's hard to give a final answer. Of course, you cannot look in the star and say, tell me what burning stage you are. But of course, from, from doing these constraints on L and M, you can make educated guesses. And when I do my hydro models, which is one of the interesting things for Ruhl, is also that for the hydro, for the first time, you, you have a mass constraint in these models. So you can also say, hey, if I have a helium burning star, I would maybe have a much stronger emission line spectrum than I see. So in this case, it must be a hydrogen burning star. Yeah, let's thank both Lucy and Andres again.